Howdy, everybody. Well, thanks for being here today. <clears throat> Welcome to October. Uh, kicking off the month with uh, an article that I've been holding on to for a long time. Anyone that's heard uh, um, my talks with Greg from the Higher Side Chats is familiar with this article, though we don't include the entire piece and we it's part of the paid platform so i'm sure many of you haven't heard the the entire article um i had originally been working on kind of like creating a comic a short comic around this article um it's it's one of my favorites and um yeah i just could never commit to the ideas and you know um so i decided a few weeks ago that i'd start the month off with this um you know a lot of you are familiar with um these kind of giant megafauna giant reptiles mammals so on and so forth so and you know my subterranean articles as well but anyways this kind of like this, this kind of covers it all and um as you can tell by the thumbnail america bc land of dragons this comes from a newspaper from west virginia in 1890 and it's a story of a man who gets lost in a cave system under the Rocky Mountains. And it's quite extraordinary. And it's a fairly long one. Um, at the end, I'll kind of show some of my other articles that correlate with this material. And yeah, as always, welcome. Um, I will absolutely be getting my Indiana episode out this week. And a week from today, October 8th, 8 8, even though it's the 10th month, you know, right? It was originally the 8th. So on 88, a week from today, we're going to do a special live radium episode like I did on um, the previous 8 8, August 8th. Um, it'll be. An interesting one. We're going to dive into uh, correlating more of the kind of esoteric side of radium. Um, we'll get into some more of the John Jacob Astor references. How that could possibly relate to his um, death on the Titanic. World War One, Radium Wars. The we'll get into a little bit of the German syndicate. Um, I did a hopped on with uh Dr. Longo for a chat about weather modification, and um, it reminded me of the first patenting of cloud seeding and the trust, the man who controlled the trust who owned all of the principal radium mines in the world, or most of them, 90%, as well as the thorium mines. Um, he also was patenting cloud seeding technology. Uh, very interesting. It's been removed from Wikipedia, so it's kind of an interesting little correlation there. But yeah, so stay tuned for that a week from today. Um, in just a few days. I'll be doing my Anomalous America episode. Whether or not I am able to do it live on Tuesday or if I end up just posting a premiere, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, likely I'll just do a premiere, but stay tuned. And this is a long article, so let's quit the jibber-jabber and hop right into it. Hope you guys are uh, enjoying this kind of material here. Uh, like I said, Charleston, Jefferson County, West Virginia, Wednesday, March 26, 1890. We're going to be right here 
a strange discovery. Zoom in a little bit more for y'all. Last summer, the schooner William Haley of Galveston traded among the West Indies was becalmed near the Gulf Stream. The second day, the captain's curiosity was aroused by a strange floating mass and he ordered the mate to take a boat and examine it. The mate retrieved, returned towing a log from which the men had cut away the marine growth, which had made it seem at a distance like a sea monster. The captain ordered it to be hoisted to the deck, declaring that in 40 years spent at sea, he had never found anything like it. When laid on the deck, it was seen to be about 20 feet long and 2 feet in diameter. It was of some very hard, dark-colored wood, like palm, charred in places and worn and broken, cut and torn as if it had been whirled through torrents and maelstroms for hundreds of years. The ends were pointed, and five bands of dark metal, like bronze, were sunk in the wood and the whole bore evidence of having passed through intense heat. On closer examination, the log was seen to consist of two parts, and these bands were to bind it together. The captain had the bands cut off, and in the exact center, fitted into a cavity, was a round stone, 18 inches in diameter. The rest of the wood was solid. The captain more disappointed at this result than he cared to confess, picked up the stone and was greatly astonished at its lightness. Examining it more closely, he remembered that when a, when a boy on the old New Hampshire farm, he used to find hollow stones with crystals in them, geodes, as he afterward heard them called. This was probably a geode placed in this strange receptacle for some unknown purpose. He carried it to his cabin and put it into his chest. Two months later, the old captain returned to his cottage on Galveston Bay and placed among his curiosities the geode he had so strangely found in the Gulf Stream. One day he studied it again, and the sunlight chanced to fall upon a narrow, irregular line. I declare, said the old man, it looks like as if this stone had been patched together. He struck it with a hammer and it fell apart and proved to be filled with small pieces of yellowish brown wood. The shell of the stone was about an inch thick, studded over inside with thousands of garnet crystals. It had been broken into three parts and fastened together again with some sort of cement, which showed plainly on the inside. The old captain poured the pieces of wood on the table. They were perfectly dry and hard. They seemed almost like strips of bamboo and were numbered and covered with writing made by pricking marks with some sharp instrument like an awl. He found the first piece of wood and began to read, for it was in English. The work of deciphering the tiny dents on the bits of wood soon became the captain's chief occupation. He copied each sentence off in his logbooks as fast as it was made out. Five or six sentences were about all his eyes could stand with a rest, so that it was a long time before the narrative was at all complete. The narrative runs as follows. The story begins. About September 17, 1886. I am an American. Thomas Parsons of Machis, Maine. I have no living relatives. I write this in a vast vaulted chamber hewn from the solid granite by some prehistoric race. I have been for months a wanderer in these subterranean spaces, and now I have contrived a way to send my message out to the world. 
that I shall probably never see again. If some miner tunneling in the Rockies comes upon a vaulted chamber with heaps of ancient weapons of bronze, bars of gold, and precious stones that no man may number, let him give Christian burial to the poor human bones that lie in this horrible feature house, treasure house, sorry. He will find all that is left of my mortal name near the great ever-burning lamp under the dome of the central hall. That lamp is fed from some reservoir of natural gas. It was lighted when I came months ago. For all I know, otherwise, it has burned there for thousands of years. The entrance to this sub-mountain river is in the Azenbaun Mountains, north of the United States line. I was a prospector there for several years, and I heard stories among the older Indians that a river greater than the Columbia had once flowed where the Rocky Mountains now are, that the Great Spirit had piled the mountains over it and buried it deep underground. At last, a medicine man, whose life I had once saved, told me that he knew how to get to the river and took me into a cavern in a deep gorge. Here we lived for a week, exploring by means of pine torches, and at last I found a passage which ran steeply downward. This, the Indian told me, was the path by which his ancestors, who once lived in the middle of the earth, had found their way to the light of day. I think we are about 3,000 feet below the entrance of the cave when we began to hear the sound of roaring waters. The sound increased until we stood by an underground river of whose width and depth we could form no idea. The light of our torches did not even reveal the height of the roof overhead. My guide told me that this was the mother of all rivers of the world. No other person expect, except himself knew of its existence. It flowed from the end of the north to the extreme south. It grew ever warmer and warmer. There was a time when the people lived along its channel, and there were houses and cities of the dead there and many strange things. It was full of fish without eyes, and they were good to eat. If I could help him build a raft, he would float with me down this river. The old, old story said that one could go upon it for many miles. It ran down a hollow under the mountains. We built and equipped our raft and launched it on the most foolhardy adventure, I do believe, that ever occupied the attention of men. We lit torches and set them in sockets on the raft, and we were well armed. For two weeks, we moved down the high archway at a steady rate of only about three miles an hour. The average width of the stream was about 500 feet, but at times it widened out to almost twice that. It swarmed with many kinds, with many kinds of fish, and they were very easy to secure. The, the rock walls of the roof seemed to be of solid granite. We were below the latter formation. As nearly as I can calculate, we were a thousand miles from where our voyage began, and nothing had yet happened to disturb its monotony when we began to find traces of ancient work and workers. An angle in the wall was hewn into a titanic figure. Another point there seemed to be regular windows, and a dwelling was perched far up in the gigantic dome. The Indian told me more of the traditions of his race as we drifted past these things. Quote, they were very great men who lived here. They had many things. They knew more than the white men. They are all dead now. And I had gathered from his chance remarks that they had left their secrets in their cave dwellings, which would make him the biggest Indian on the continent if he could discover them. 
Suddenly, we found that the river was flowing much faster, and we failed to check our raft. We went over a waterfall, perhaps 70 feet high, and were thrown on a shelf of rock at the side of the river below. I was unhurt, but my companion was so badly injured that he died in a few hours. I repaired the raft after a fashion and continued the voyage, finding it impossible to contrive any way to scale the sides of the waterfall and attempt to return. All our torches were lost, and the attempt to proceed further seemed but the last act of despair. A few hours later, I saw a light gleam over the river in a very remarkable way, shining clear across as if from the headlight of a locomotive high up on the wall. This aroused me somewhat from my stupor and misery. I sat up on the raft and steered it close to the edge of the river to see what wonderful thing had happened. As I came nearer, I saw that an irregular hole was in the wall a thousand feet above the water and that the light shone out through it. It was a cheerful thing to look at, and I hung to the granite and shouted, but to no effect. Then I saw a broken place in the wall a little further down, and let the raft drift along to the base of a broad, thorough, much worn, and broken flight of steps, winding up the cliff that brought me at last to the place of light. A domed hall overlooked the river, hewn out of the rock and having in its center a metal basin with a jet of natural gas. I have had to cut off a part of this metal basin since but I have not harmed the inscriptions. There are many gas jets, but in the other chambers I have had to light them. I have lived here for months now, and I have explored all the chambers of the place. There is no escape so far as I can see. The river, 20 miles below, plunges down vaster descents, and the water gets so hot that I should be boiled alive if I tried the voyage. I have discovered a log of tropic wood, like palm, and a geode in which I can send a message to the world of sunlight. Perhaps this will get through the fires and float to the surface somewhere. I am convinced that the river which brought me here flows on into the Gulf of Mexico, and that sooner or later my log will be picked up. Perhaps this river is really the source of the Gulf Stream. I will now write down my discoveries, not in order, but as a whole. My story must be brief, for the scant means of the record will fail me. This place seems to have been approached only by river. It consists of six large domed halls connected with a seventh in which the light burns. There are bronze swords, spearheads, and other weapons stored in one chamber. There have been costly fabrics also, but they have perished, and only a few fragments are left. In other halls are many treasures accumulated. I do not attempt to estimate the riches here. Montezuma's lost treasure is said to have been $80 million, but I believe the hidden treasure house of this forgotten race would dwarf to insignificance the riches of the Aztecs, and the Peruvians put together. The gold is in great bars, which I cannot lift, or I would have tried to make a golden vessel to carry my story. The silver is in yet more huge blocks, perhaps five feet square. Everything here is cyclopean. A granite chest higher than my head is full to the brim with rings and precious stones. What surprises me most is that there are diamonds, pearls, and amber among them. What a wildly extended commerce this people must have had before they descended to the subterranean river and hid their treasures here. One hall is especially the hall of pictures and of writing. I spend many hours there. I see the history of this race, their wars, 
their heroes, their mythology. They are like the Egyptians in many things, but they are not Egyptians. Nevertheless, they have some of the art spirit too. Perhaps they lived in the time before Atlantis was overwhelmed. Perhaps they were antediluvians. One thing is certain, they had poets, historians, philosophers in those days. I wish I could write down here a tithe of all the wisdom I had find on the gaily painted walls of these ancients of so many ages. The most wonderful chamber of all is the hall to the north, that is, the chamber of death and silence. When first I entered this hall, I lighted all the gas jets. Around the walls were high cases of drawers, and on the front of each was a portrait. I examined them for hours before I felt any desire to do more. Among them, I observed a very beautiful face, that of a young girl just entering womanhood. This wonderful race possessed the highest artistic skill and delicacy of expression. The face of this girl, except that the colors had faded, might have been the admired masterpiece of the Paris Salon. I felt a sudden interest in the face and caught the drawer handles and pulled it out. In the wide, deep space into which I looked, lay robed in white, her hands folded, the form of the girl whose picture was on the outside. How beautiful she was. She lay as if only asleep. Then slowly as I looked, the whole figure melted down and faded away to a pile of dust. I closed the shrine and touched no more of them, but I often go and look at the faded paintings and think how lovely the girl was. The paintings on the walls of this mural chamber show that the people had two systems of disposing of their dead. The great mass were consigned to the river, but the bodies of those who were famous for beauty, wisdom, or any good quality were preserved by a process of embalming, which they evidently thought would make them endure for ages. There are probably twelve thousand separate bodies here, and they represent more than twenty successive generations. If I rightly understand the system of family grouping, if people lived as long as they do now, there was an average of about 15 additions each year to this great Westminster Abbey of the past. From a sort of map painted on one of the walls, I obtained the idea of many a thickly populated communities which used this place as the sepulcher of their chosen few. Evidently, that was before volcanic outburst made the channel of the river like a cauldron boiling over endless fires. All along the course are towns marked, groups of rock-hewn rooms on the cliffs, populated lands on the river, promotaries from whose sides fountains of light seem to spring. Did thousands of people once live and find happiness in these vast faults of death? Things must have been very different then from now. They must have had many reservoirs of natural gas. The animal life in the river must have been much more varied. Indeed, there are pictures in the halls of war, as I have named it, that show two things plainly. That there were thousands of caverns, extending over hundreds of miles and peopled by animals with which the heroes fought and that the river was swarming with existence. Moreover, I find everywhere chief of the symbols of life in the most sacred places a food root like a water nut from which grew white leaves and seeds. There must have been some electric principle involved here by the vast warm lakes of the river, lit with soft light everywhere at certain seasons. For now, I come to the strangest fact of all that I have gathered from the records of this race. 
these people had two kinds of light. One, they found and lit, that they knew as the lesser god of life. The other, coming from north to south, twice each year, filled for many weeks the whole channel of the river from depth to dome, making the very water translucent. The water root and its grain ripened and were harvested in the last days of the light. Two crops a year they gathered and held their days of the feasts of the greater God of life. I have tried to put together all I can of their picture writings and their paintings so as to understand what sort of men and women they were. I confess that I have learned to admire them greatly. They were strong, brave, loving, and beautiful people. I am sorry they are all gone. I never cared half so much about the dead Etruscans or Carthaginians. The earliest chapter in their history, so far as I can discover, is a picture of a line of men and women descending into a cave and a dragon pursuing them. This seems to point to a former residence on the face of the earth and to some disaster, war, flood, pestilence, or some fierce monster which drove the survivors into the depths of the earth for shelter. But all these thoughts are vain and foolish. I have explored the cliffs of the river and the walls of the mighty halls which shelter me. I have attempted to cut a tunnel upward past the waterfall using the ancient weapons which lie in such numbers on the floor. The bronze wears out too fast, but if I live long enough, something may be done. I will close my record and launch it down the river. Then I will try to cut my way out to sunlight. Here the story closed. Some day, perhaps an old man, white-haired and pale as one from the lowest dungeon of a Bastille, will climb slowly out of some canyon of the Rockies to tell the world more about his discovery of a lost race. I mean, just an absolutely astounding article. And, you know, out of context or so to say, without much of a background, at least from my perspective, this is pure fantasy, right? Um, but for me, uh, let's just go a little. Uh, that's too small. It's too small. Uh, but for me, as I get further along through this, and especially presenting Anomalous America and kind of putting all this out there and creating a kind of narrative, um, it this rings more and more true. And I've read this dozens of times, but having read it out loud and recording it, it's just like, you know, it makes my hair stand up. Um, it corroborates so many things. I've talked a lot about the subterranean realms. I've talked a lot about dragons, giant reptiles, you know, the, the, the terrible lizards, the, the previous ages of giants, men and animal alike. Um, the idea of man warring with beast. You know, he mentions the Carthaginians, he mentions, you know, the Phoenicians, he mentions the Atlanteans, and that, you know, and the Antediluvians. And it just, and then you, there's just so much here. The vaulted rooms, the, the embalming like the Egyptians. I mean, we have, I presented mummies found from California all the way, you know, into Ohio. And that they all keep kind of corroborating each other as far as um, the time frames and the technologies. And it's just mind blowing, really. And I, I just love it so much. So to, to kind of wrap this video up, there's no right way to do it. I could go back through all of my anomalous Americas. Um, but yeah, let's, we're going to go through a few of them here and then we're going to share an old book from the 1600s to kind of uh, further illustrate my point. 
So here we are in Anomalous America, Episode 6, Utah. And every one of these series has something that correlates with that article I just read. But I'm just going to highlight a few here. Pulse of Western Progress, Nebraska, 1894. 120-foot-long dragon found in Utah. Circular hole descended 80 feet. Vast underground cavern. Grandest sight ever beheld by man. A petrified reptile. Perfect in every detail. 18-inch curved fangs. Only perfect specimen of a dragon in existence. I'm going to read a few more of my highlighted points from this. A Y... A line of white barrel hoops standing upright and extending away into the darkness, farther than his one candle could shed its rays. Judge of his astonishment to find on examination that he had discovered the petrified skeleton of an enormous reptile, perfect in every detail, from head to tail. The bones of the head showed plainly that the monster was very well equipped for aggressive warfare. Curved fangs hinged to the upper jaw. 18 inches long, lay in place in what was once a huge mouth, which could easily open four feet. Judging from the articulation, the monster lay in a nearly straight line, and Mr. Handy found upon pacing it off that it measured upwards of 120 feet. About 50 feet from the head lay a number of bones that appeared to be to belong to the skeleton, and which Mr. Hardy concluded were the wings. Further examination disclosed the presence of legs, though only one of these was in good condition. Judge Watson, who has read much on prehistoric mammalian fossils, states that this is probably the only perfect specimen of a dragon in existence. Now, just like the megafauna, the fossil records, the terrible lizards, the kind of dinosaur lie, but I've been talking about these time frames being far closer that man not only walked with dinosaur, but befriended them in many cases um, or was at war with them. There are illustrations of dinosaurs found in, in, in the Amazon and Peru and Chile in Mesoamerica and North America on, on some maps, Northern America, Canada, Northern American region was known as the land of the Drake. And, and 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 as I was stating with those same thing, what 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 goes hand in hand with it in the 1800s? Well, the Smithsonian Institution has been informed of the find, and we expect to have a representative here in a few days. Mister Hardy refused one offer of twenty thousand dollars for his find, and states that nothing short of fifty thousand dollars will will purchase it. He has been trying to keep the discovery a secret in order to prepare for the rush that is sure to follow his announcement. But we are here to write up the news and our readers may look for more disclosures as the cavern is further explored. Well, let me tell you what that Smithsonian man got there and he got his $50,000. I guarantee you, um, you know, in some of my previous videos for, for, for new listeners out there, um, I've done videos on these giant reptiles and giant mammals, you know, giant, giant mammals that live in the caves of Alaska, um, that, that are beyond belief. Seem like that they're out of a movie. In fact, I, I've gone as far as to state that a lot of you know these kind of ideas of these movies have been based on these historical records, and this is no different. But yeah, so they were paying they were paying up millions of dollars bounties for these kind of curiosities, so to say, millions of dollars. Okay, and they had you know the big game hunters from all around the world traveling to Alaska, the Congo, South America, hunting these few remaining um, animals that survived this kind of changeover event from these different epochs, the kind of stragglers, so to say. But that's just one. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll continue on. I want to read a few about cities. Extraordinary discoveries in Utah, Kansas Territory, 1855. The most astonishing discoveries, ruins of a large city similar to Petra, 40 miles long, 25 miles in width, ruins of towns and villages, walls three or four stories high, 
Cedar Joyce, every building a fortification, the strongest imaginable. Prehistoric Cave, Arkansas, 1913. Now, again, when I state these, that's the publication that the paper's in. But when I, I'm, I'm reading these from my episode on the Utah um, Anomalous America. So, again, if you're new to my material, check out my Anomalous America series. If you like this kind of stuff, you'll love those episodes. Walls covered. So this is a cave. This is a cave in Utah. Walls covered with pictures and hieroglyphics appear to be prehistoric. A mammoth cave rivaling the caves of Kentucky. Front chamber 75 by 150 yards, 41 feet high. Now, remember, all throughout the Utah area, they're finding caves like this. They're finding ruins of ancient cities. And these aren't just like Pueblo cities. Okay, Some of these are stone-hewn, massive buildings. Massive. In fact, the largest buildings ever found, ancient, quote, ancient buildings, were found here in Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico. And for sake of time, I'm not going to read this whole article. I will leave a link to... Um, a few of my anomalous America episodes in the, in the, in the comments are in the uh, description. So you can follow up if you want more information. Um, here we talk about the name Ohio. It was an Indian word derived from the speech of an Aboriginal tribe, but the word Utah is of Egyptian origin. It belongs to hieroglyphic characters of ancient speech. It signifies the eye sacred in the name of Osiris, the sun the source of light. Mummies found in Utah, Kentucky, 1894, discovered beneath the ruins of the cliff dwellers, seven mummies. They are not the bodies of the cliff dwellers, but of some race that lived before them. Their hair is reddish instead of black. Yeah, they lie below. They lie below. In many of these Anomalous America episodes, I show that below these kind of Pueblo cultures and these, these uh, quote, Indian races or Aboriginal cultures of America, they themselves say that there were giant cities and advanced races who warred and were wiped out, and that some of their remnants were were redheads. Some were peaceful, um, amazingly um, peaceful, beautiful, um, redheaded culture people, and some were cannibals, kind of two opposing tribes, and that they ended up, the peaceful tribe went went south, and they never came back. And it kind of it has a Quetzalcoatl vibe. They taught them agriculture, uh, astronomy, uh, um, some writing, on and on. Anyways, continuing on. Um, these are really important because we talk about Indian mounds. And I've made the correlation for many years now that some were burial mounds. Some were people buried on top of ancient structures. They uncovered some mounds that they thought to be just hills, and they found, oh, maybe this is an Indian mound, a burial mound. They found them to be giant buildings, giant buildings. For example, workmen leveling a large mound on Temple Street, okay, this is in downtown Salt Lake, exhumed many relics, pottery, arrowheads, sulfur, a row of fireplaces discovered, a long period of time elapsed since buried, the bones of larger stature than the Utah Indians. Yeah, and I've said too, and I've shown pretty amazing cooperation for this, that many of the U.S. cities are just built upon ancient ruins, ancient cities, races that have come before. I'm not talking about, you know, you know, Indians or, or Native Americans, because even they say that there was an advanced culture here before them, and it was wiped out by some kind of event. Mementos of the Utah Mound Builders, Illinois, 1877. The mounds are six in number, cover 20 acres excavating a large skeleton six feet six inches in his hand a huge steel weapon large drilled stone pipe 1400 years ago the nephites and the lamanites a cement case full of different seeds now i've talked about some of these ancient seeds they quote mummy seeds or mummy corn or mummy wheat and that they come from a age unlike ours they grew in a much more oxygen rich environment this this crosses over nicely to the megafauna the culture of the vapor canopy when the world was one tropical climate and that the air density was much higher because they've planted some of this corn some of this wheat some of these other um, crops and they found that they're absolutely monstrous in size 
So if they're monstrous in size in our environment, our low oxygen, uh, much lower density, um, atmospheric density, and they're still growing 15 feet or taller, and the wheat is unbelievable in size. Can you imagine how big these crops were? If the oxygen was 50% higher or more? I mean, you know, they were growing, they were taking current tomato plants from seeds of our um, kind of genus, and they were growing them in oxygen-rich um hyperbaric type chambers where they could up the density and they grew a tomato plant 40 feet tall and harvested uh, i can't remember the amount but it was over a thousand pounds of tomatoes so i think we're getting closer to this type of event this type of uh climate and um the world again being a very far to very far different place right how could we support a dragon and, and these larger reptiles well if you had again the density up and the oxygen up would be much easier. Ancient city in Utah. An ancient city has been discovered in the southern part of the territory. Immense quantities of broken and burnt earthenware, adobe, bricks, crucibles, ruins of two miles long and one wide, remains of a temple covered in acre. Giant petrified creatures. Huge creatures petrified. Look at this one. This lizard will fill 15 cards. Beast of prehistoric Utah is quarried from solid rock. The fixed fifth box car loaded with part of a skeleton of a lizard started for the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. It will fill 10 more cars, 84 feet long, quarried from and in blocks cut from solid rock. On and on and on. Again, if this is something you're interested in, I, I strongly recommend watching the episode. Um, or you can just read these threads that are also in the description of these episodes. I'm going to do a few from Colorado. Again, we're in the Rockies, right? We're going into and around the American Southwest. Um, chained in a cave. In the mountains near Colorado Springs, a remarkable cavern, a pyramid. At the base, of a, at the base a skeleton of the most gigantic proportion. Around the waist, an iron band, brass chains. The other side, another skeleton, female, left to starve and die. Two giants were chained to a pyramid in a giant cave. Ancient Colorado, ruins of an ancient and once populous city, highly cultured and enlightened race, houses, corrals, towns, fortifications, ditches, pottery, drawings, writings, buildings of every size, the largest being 300 by 6,000 feet. The walls are ornamented. This is a building over a mile long, 300 feet wide and over a mile long. On and on. Um, this is a story about um, the Baron um, arrested for stealing giants. Um, I can't remember where he was from. I want to say uh, Sweden or something along those lines. Um, Baron Nordenskold was arrested in Colorado for stealing relics and giants and mummies and pottery interesting fossils in the garden of the gods a reptile 117 feet long exposed by rain several hundred pounds of bones removed another animal 10 feet long in the stomach of this monster petrified nuts larger than a pint cup a much milder climate yeah this is that vapor canopy age these are the kind of creatures that were living in it okay Giant seeds, a nut as large as a pint cup, an animal 10 feet long in its stomach. A mound 100 feet high, standing in the valley of Laguna, found to be a giant building. Wonderful petrifactions in Colorado, several large mounds, petrified coconut, much larger than normal, others resembling fruits, seeds embedded within the crystal, shells found in a great variety and quantity, dozens of petrified sea turtles, and immense ocean. Imagine, right, as the article stated, the previous article said that before the Rocky Mountains were there, it was a giant river covered in populations, giant cities, and a tropical climate. This is what we were dealing with. Giant tropical fruit, giant coconuts, giant sea turtles of an unbelievable size. So yeah, again, if 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 this type of material interests you, please check out my Anomalous America series. You can find a playlist on my channel. And lastly, we're going to go look at this book, Mundus Subterraneus. Okay, this is from 1678. 
this is an incredible book. I will also have a link for this in the description. Okay. Um, basically, this book goes on to say that every large mountain range in the world houses a giant subterranean lake. Every single one of them. And these lakes are absolutely humongous. And that these mountains are all hollow. Similar kind of to what we were just uh, talking about there. And uh, what does he state? He states that this subterranean river that gets so hot it boils life. And that he thinks it eventually um, becomes the Gulf Stream and empties into the Gulf of Mexico. Well, why is that important? Well, in one of these maps, they show that this Gulf of Mexico stream comes out of Tenochtitlan. Right, and he's mentioning Montezuma's gold in the article. He's also mentioning the Atlanteans. Now, I've connected in many of my old posts and some of my older videos that I believe, uh, as Montezuma himself says, the people were brought there by an advanced culture. Um, some authors have postulated that, that the culture was Atlantean or Phoenician, and that they brought him from the peninsula of Florida and perhaps from elsewhere, but originally from the east. And I've, I've said that the largest port city, Tampa, a port of Atlantis, is where they were brought from. And as that article stated, and as I postulated before, I've never shared this before, but this map corroborates this quite nicely. And this book is incredible. I could just do a whole series on this book. Um, if this is something you'd like me to dive into more, please let me know in the comments. Uh, and lastly here. We have Tenochtitlan and the Gulf Stream that connects and it goes into the mountain range, right? And Atlantis was known for harvesting and using natural gas as well as other advanced technologies. So just the, the story just, you know, again, from, you know, a close observation seems just like, fantasy but covering all the material i've covered in the last 15 years or so of hard research i feel like it's very much a real story and that you're looking at a, a real first-hand account of what lies in the rocky mountains and i can just only continually think about you know the i've done a video that all deep underground military bases are directly correspondent to these ancient um habitations of man underground and that we were driven underground by not only cataclysmic events but also gigantic creatures oh so yeah thank you all for tuning in as always um so like i said make sure to check out the description if you want more uh information more more uh detailed on uh, anomalous america this map, uh, this book, if you want to dive into it on your own, let me know in the comments what you think. If you want me to do, you know, maybe another video just on this book, I'd be happy to. So, but uh, again, October 1st, starting the month off, you know, uh, with some good material, I think. And um, yeah, if you want more, let me know and uh, make sure to stay tuned for Anomalous America, Indiana. I know it's been a long delay. Appreciate everyone's patience. Uh, you know, family and timing just always doesn't work out uh, the way I want it to. But that's that's life. No big deal. And uh, make sure to tune in a week from today, 8-8, October 8th, for um, the next installment in the Radium series. And as always, love and peace. Have a wonderful day, guys. Bye.